Thank you for joining us tonight. And thank you. We have Dr. Jim Lindsay, uh, who, as um, Joey described, is uh, uh, the deep state. <laughs> he joins us tonight to discuss what it means for America to seek to beat its allies rather than lead them in his new book, The Empty Throne, America's Abdication of Global Leadership that you wrote with uh, Ambassador Evo Dalder. So uh, we're very grateful that you wrote this book and grateful that you're here tonight. Um, well, thank you for having me here. It's a real delight to be here in San Francisco. It's an absolutely lovely city, and you delivered up absolutely lovely weather. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I take full credit for that. Well, uh, <laughs> the, thank um, you. Uh, uh, Unlike a lot of positions that have been staked out mm -hmm. by President Trump over time, mm -hmm. uh, his foreign policy, as you describe in your book, has actually been fairly consistent over the last 31 years. If you go back to what he published in 1987 in the New York Times, uh, it sounds strikingly familiar. Well, could, you, could you describe what, what that policy view is, what that worldview is? Uh, happy to. I mean, the president, again, uh, has had a consistent worldview. You were referring to the 1987 letter to the American people, in which uh, you, in some sense, formed a blueprint or a draft of the president's uh, 2016 presidential campaign. His argument was that America was being taken advantage of by its friends and allies, that they were riding on the security benefits the United States provided, and they were stealing American jobs. Uh, in that case, he railed against uh, the fact that the United States was protecting oil convoys in the Middle East, uh, arguing that uh, Japan was ripping us off and that uh, our friends and allies were laughing at us. And again, I think you could take that 1987 letter to the American people, make a few minor adjustments to it, and you have his uh, campaign platform in 2016. In what underlaid that view of the world is an important one. And it's a notion that world politics is about competition. And what we should be doing is pursuing our narrow self-interest. And if we do so, we're going to maximize our wins. That's a very different view than the view taken by the greatest generation. When they uh, came out of the end of World War II, they had lived with the consequences of when countries pursued their narrow self-interest, and they tried to create an order to prevent that because they had seen World War I, they had seen World War II. So um, we saw World War I, we mm -hmm. saw World War II. Uh, the, the percentage of Americans who've supported the, the world V you've described mm -hmm. um, has generally bounced between 20% and 30% of the public, uh, never much more than that. Mm -hmm. Why now? Why, why is there this sudden support for a worldview that many people thought was discredited 70 years ago um, and that um, uh, many people say uh, would have kept us in the same sort of chaos as opposed to having America rise to become the most prosperous and secure nation mm -hmm. in human history? An excellent question. I would make two points. Number one, the fact that Donald Trump was elected president and campaigned on America first doesn't mean that America first elected Donald Trump. There are lots of other reasons for President Trump's victory, and I think we have to avoid the temptation, which is very strong in Washington, D.C., to sort of conflate this into a story of Americans have turned against the world outside, turned inward, rejected the world, and Donald Trump led the way. The second point I make, and we can explore it more if you wish, is you look at public opinion polling since Donald Trump became president, particularly the polling done by the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, where my co-author, Evo Dalder, is president, has shown that President Trump is actually losing the debate with the American public on America's role in the world. That's true whether you ask general questions about do you think America should be actively engaged in the world. We're at record levels now. Uh, it's not the case that America's turning in with. Or if you look at specific agreements, for example, the president uh, took the United States out of the Iran nuclear deal. The president uh, also uh, took the United States out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. 
uh, which and also I would mention uh, Par Paris Climate Agreement, and what's remarkable in all three of those agreements, public support for them has gone up even in the face of the president's repeated denunciations of those agreements. And it's not simply a function of the polarization of the American public, because support for these agreements are up with Democrats, independents, and Republicans. And why is that? I think the American public actually tends to be pretty prudent. And uh, much like you don't notice oxygen till it's gone, now all of a sudden you have a president who calls our friends foes. People begin to worry that the long-term consequences of that for America's security and prosperity won't be good. Well, why don't we talk about what, what it means when you say won't be good? Okay. Because what we're talking about with the uh, forfeiture of... U.S. global leadership is, you know, focus on a rules-based order mm -hmm. where decisions are made by multilateral institutions, not by just one, one, mm -hmm. one country. The um, a free trade, mm -hmm. uh, an alliance-based system in which uh, the U.S. works with other partners around the world to advance its its interests, and that there is a commitment among those countries to democracy, human rights, and civil rights. Um, that's an that's, excellent summary of, of the rules-based or international order. I mean, I oh, very thanks. well done. Thanks. <laughs> um, I'm going to have to quote you on that. Yes, it's better, well, probably a better summary than I've given. Yeah, so. ambassador school. Oh, okay. There you go. Um, what, your thoughts about what happens to those institutions okay. uh, in, the, you know, in, in the world order that is now being developed by this administration? Okay. Uh, there are two ways at least that I could answer the question. One is to go all macro on you and talk about the big historical sweep of things, or I could go narrow and talk about some specific uh, action. So why don't I actually do both, and I'll do okay. it quickly, and then we can decide uh, where you want to go. On the macro level, the, the significant thing about U.S. exercising leadership role, and let me emphasize here, by leadership I mean mobilizing friends and allies to address common problems and to develop solutions. That's what leadership is about. It is about mobilizing other countries. And historically, uh, the United States, since the end of World War II, had done a great job of that. The president is sort of pulled back from that. He doesn't believe that's the role. And so the question asked is, if you create a vacuum, what is going to fill it? Nature tends to abhor a vacuum. I think the Chinese quite clearly are hoping they can fill the vacuum. Uh, it's debatable whether they will succeed or not. We can discuss that. Uh, but I'll simply say that if the Chinese get to set the rules, they will not be rules that favor American interests. Beijing has no incentive to want to do things that are going to help the United States. But obviously another possibility on that score is nobody is capable of filling the vacuum and that you will go back to the world we tried to escape, one of growing nationalism, geopolitical competition, where what the sort of the time-honored slogan reigns, the strong do as they will, the weak suffer as they must. That would be a more conflictual world. It would also be a less prosperous world than the one we currently have. But let's sort of shift away from macro picture. Well, I, well, well let me do okay. the macro picture and then we'll do the okay. micro because I, I think they're both interesting. So there may be a third option. Mm -hmm. So there, you know, the the absence of American leadership, maybe no leadership, and just to return to um, the the world that we had mm -hmm. um, pre end of World War II, um, then there could be China mm -hmm. uh, filling the vacuum, or you could have. Uh, essentially a series of regional hegemonies. Mm -hmm. So China tries to control Asia um, the, um, uh, and, and parts of Africa and, mm -hmm. and the stands. Uh, the Russia is in competition mm -hmm. for that along with the European Union and the U.S. is left to mm -hmm. um, dominate North and South America. Mm -hmm. that, that would be one, one world that could emerge from all this. Well, I would just, that's actually a variant of, of the second world in which yeah. you have great powers, each trying to dominate its sphere of interest. Yeah. And to many people, when they hear that, that makes sense. The big powers should sort of get the police its neighborhood. Problem is, historically, number one, great powers seldom agree on what the boundaries of the neighborhood are. <laughs> but the second thing is the neighbors often don't like being told what to do. Uh, and again, if you want to see that, read uh, the history of Europe. I mean, look at uh, what happened in Europe in the run-up uh, to World War I. You had a system in which you had great powers who thought they had 
spheres of influence, but they couldn't agree on uh, who actually got to say where, and they rubbed up against each other in a lot of places. And eventually that geopolitical competition spilled over into actual war. Likewise, there's often talk about the current international economic system could break up into just this sort of three great blocks, an Asia block dominated by China, an America's block dominated by the United States, and a Europe block dominated by the Europeans. Certainly possible, uh, if such a war were to come up, it's likely, or some, such a, a world were to come up, it's likely to be a less prosperous one than we could have otherwise, because obviously, if you are in the Americas, you're not going to be able to sell into the European market or you're the Chinese dominated, you're not going to sell into the American market. Uh, and so on and so forth. And again, you're likely to get competition because there are always going to be spaces that are disputed. Who gets to sell into Africa? Or is Latin America really part of the Americas? Uh, where does Europe end and Asia begin? Uh, and again, you can see how you could end up with a world that's a lot different than we have today. And I'm reminded of a uh, passage in Ernest Hemingway's The Sun Also Rises, where one of the characters was asked uh, how he had gone bankrupt, and he said, well, slowly at first and then quickly. <laughs> uh, and I think world order, that uh, could be the case. I got that from uh, the historian Bob Kagan with his new book, The yeah. Jungle Grows Back, which is very, very good, by the way. Yeah. Uh, well, that, that, that sets us up well, I think, to talk mm -hmm. about these micro decisions and how those play into um, America's economic strength. For example, mm -hmm. abandoning TPP, mm -hmm. uh, you know, our, our security relations around the world, uh, the abandonment of our agreement with other countries uh, on the Iran deal, mm -hmm. and then um, just our global leadership on issues that affect um, uh, all countries like uh, climate change. Well, why don't we begin with TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the trade deal negotiated uh, when President Obama was president. It involves 12 Pacific Rim countries. It was going to uh, bring together about 40% of uh, the world economy. It had both an economic logic, but also a strategic logic. I should note that the ambassador here was involved in this and yeah. knows these issues uh, even better than I do. And again, the idea was to create this block. It would be a counterweight to China, in essence, to create an economic powerhouse uh, that would put pressure on the Chinese to conform its rules, to play by the rules of the rules-based order. It also had the advantage for American uh, manufacturers, American farmers, American exporters, that it was going to make it uh, easier for them to export abroad. And I'll just do a shout out here for the great state of Iowa since I spent 12 years there. For all four of my children were born in Iowa. Iowa is a big pork producing state. And so in late 2016, if you were an Iowa pork producer, you were looking at TPP was going to come into effect. You would get access that you had long wanted to the Japanese market. And you would be able to not only have access, you'd have better terms than the Europeans had. Well, one of the things that happened was the president comes in President Trump, third day in office, pulls the United States out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, does it without any strategic review, any sort of assessment of why are we doing this, what are the consequences of doing this, uh, what should we have, what should our plan be, our alternative be, none of that took place, simply pulled it out. Well, the Japanese uh, did not do what the administration thought and simply go, well, that's the end of TPP. They worked our friends uh, other members of the trade agreement to negotiate a new version called TPP-11, uh, which still is sort of holding the door for the United States if it wants to come out. But the Japanese also said, okay, if the Americans don't want to work with us, we'll do a trade deal with the Europeans. And now all of a sudden it is Italian pork producers that are going to get that preferential access to Japanese markets and Iowa uh, pork farmers are going to be at a disadvantage. That's sort of a, a tangible example of how the president's decisions are going to have long-term effects that may be very hard to get away from, uh, but they don't necessarily manifest themselves the day he makes a decision. So in the current lexicon, that would be a really bad deal. <laughs> yes, it would be. I know, but uh, actually, but, but uh, one, one aspect of the bad deal mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you is um, about China. So one of the aspects of TPP was not simply to expand our um, uh, areas that we could sell into and to mm -hmm. raise standards mm -hmm. uh, to make the competition with them more fair, 
but it was to, as you said, um, create a counterweight to China. So China really did not want TPP to go forward with U.S. leadership. Why didn't the president at the outset of the administration, when he abandoned TPP, at least try to get some concessions from China? Say, well, I promised this on the campaign trail, but I'm rethinking it. I need some sweeteners from China before I could do this. Instead, he, mm-hmm. he, he just did it on day one without asking anything from China. Well, you're exactly right. And I will uh, say, having been in Beijing and Shanghai and having talked to uh, Chinese diplomats and government officials and think tank uh, writers, they all ask the same question. <laughs> uh, they're trying to wonder why a gentleman who prided himself on the art of the deal would give up something tangible for nothing. And I think you know part of which you have to recognize when you look at the president is that TPP is not unique in terms of his style. We've seen it over and over again. And that is the president makes decisions without any uh, attempt to sort of think through what the consequences might be. He doesn't sort of think through, he doesn't develop a strategy. This is true of TPP. It's true of leaving the Paris Climate Agreement. It's true of leaving the Iran nuclear deal. It was true of the way they approached the NAFTA renegotiations. The president uh, tends to approach these things without a strategy. The notion is, I'm going to disrupt. And this is a phrase he often uses, we'll see what happens. Uh, now, I don't know whether that's a useful way to approach things in the world of New York real estate, uh, but I think when you're talking about international diplomacy, uh, doing things without having a strategy for the inevitable consequences, and a lot of these consequences are easily predictable, is a recipe uh, for heartache. Yeah. But what happens with the Iran deal? I mean, essentially... Um, you know, is the president actually being clever? And he's become a free rider on other deals. So TPP, mm-hmm. um, we we bullied everyone into signing this thing. And then after mm-hmm. everyone signed on, we abandoned it. They're responsible for enforcing TPP, and we're not bound by any of its um, terms. And the Iran deal, uh, the same thing. Everyone else who signed up, uh, the uh, uh, P plus five, um, uh, they have, um, they've, they've stuck to the deal, mm-hmm. and we've abandoned it. We're getting some of the advantages of the deal um, without having to pay the consequences. Is he, is, is he actually getting away with something? Well, I, I don't know that we are actually getting anything uh, in a substantive national interest sense for announcing that we're going to withdraw from or having withdrawn from the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, I, I think, you know, when you, when you look at it, it is remarkable that the United States now finds itself opposed not just by Iran, not just by Iran, Russia, and China, but by our three closest allies, Britain, France, and Germany. I mean, it's very hard for me to go back over the last 75 years of American foreign policy to find anything quite like this. Uh, and it's for a fairly straightforward reason uh, for the British, the French, uh, and the Germans, they cannot see a reason to pull out of the deal because that would take a threat that we may not have to deal with for another 10 to 15 years, it takes it out of the future, brings it right up into the present day. And the question is, why would we want to do that? But the problem is even deeper than that. Okay? The message the president sent over the course of his campaign, once again, we talked about the 1987 letter, that America's friends and allies had taken it for a ride. They hadn't done enough. In the case of the Iran nuclear deal, the president made clear his unhappiness with it, and it wasn't a perfect deal by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, The British, the French, the Germans came forward with a variety of proposals to address the president's legitimate concerns about the deal. And what's remarkable is not just that the president didn't take our closest allies up on their offer, the administration never really did a sort of thorough review of whether it made sense to do so. They simply gave the allies the back of the hand. And we've seen this on a number of occasions uh, where allies have said, friends have said, we want to work with you. And the administration's response has been to dismiss them. We've seen it most notably in confronting China uh, on its predatory trade practices. And that sets up a central irony. A presidential candidate who said he was going to make others do more is a president who seldom takes up the offer from others who want to do more. So that's why America first has this tendency to morph into America alone. Well, one of the people who's been trying to 
keep the rules-based order of liberal democracy moving forward mm -hmm. in the um, uh, in the absence of American leadership was uh, Angela Merkel, mm -hmm. who announced uh, today that she will be um, leaving the leadership at the end of the year. And so, what what impact do you see that having on our ability to maintain some some semblance of order during mm -hmm. this during this period? Oh, it undoubtedly makes it harder because Merkel dominated German politics uh, for quite a long time and was able to mo uh, mobilize German voters. So I wouldn't downplay it at all. And but I would sort of take it back. It's the you know, to a sort of broader picture, and this is not in the book, but in an article that Evo Dalder and I have in uh, the latest issue of Foreign Affairs called. Uh, called the Committee to Save the World, which argues that America's allies have to step up as America steps down. And as you look at it, uh, our friends and allies have to do more than complain that President Trump isn't doing or isn't behaving like uh, previous presidents and that it's time for our friends and allies to do more. And they obviously have a stake in doing so. Uh, because they benefited enormously from this rules-based order. And indeed, to some extent, uh, President Trump has sort of reinvigorated debate because he has shown people what the world might look like uh, without American leadership. And I think countries have realized maybe that's not a good place to go to. And that's why you've seen friends and allies doing more on trade, doing more on security issues. And I think that is important. Uh, but in doing so, obviously, lots of obstacles. You can talk about uh, Chancellor Merkel not running for re-election as her party head. But again, what is remarkable over the last 18 months is we have, in fact, seen our friends and allies doing a lot more, trying to do a lot more. Just last week, uh, the Canadian government hosted uh, a meeting of countries. They did not invite the United States or China about how to reform and improve the World Trade Organization. That's motivated directly by concern about the fact that the Trump administration may leave the World Trade Organization, uh, and that would have significant, perhaps catastrophic effects for global trade. Uh, but we do see our friends and allies trying to step up. So one of the problems for friends and allies who are trying to step up is um, there are a lot of empty offices in, uh, in the State Department and in, in the federal government. Yep. And you cover this in the book. You talk a bit about the, the transition process and, and, and what its results have been. Could you, could you fill us in a little bit on that? Uh, happy to. You know this issue better than I do, having served as an ambassador, how important it is to have people to represent the United States, how important it is to have people working on these issues, whether they are in Maine State, the Pentagon, whether at a consulate general overseas or at the embassy in Canberra or what have you. I mean, when we talk about foreign policy issues, there's a whole slew of them. Uh, and they can be very, very important, and they actually do require expertise. They also require having people out there listening, but also representing the United States. And I think one of the clear tragedies of the Trump administration is that American diplomacy has been decimated. Uh, you have seen two things happen with the Trump administration. One is it has been remarkably slow to fill positions in the U.S. government. And let's just take the diplomatic service, and I won't give you the overall stats. I'll simply note that right now we have a crisis in the Middle East involving the murder of the journalist uh, Jamal Khashoggi. It involves Turkey and Saudi Arabia. The United States does not have an ambassador either in Ankara or Riyadh. That is not because... Democrats in the United States Senate have refused to provide their consent, the administration hasn't nominated anybody. And that's a story told time and again. And, and again, you, having served as an ambassador, ambassadors provide a critical function. And uh, the second thing we see happening is that the administration has driven people out of the Foreign Service. And other people in the Foreign Service have seen the writing on the wall, and they've left voluntarily. And if anyone has ever been in an organization, when you hemorrhage good people, you lose a tremendous amount of institutional knowledge. You learn, you lose how to do things. You lose the notion of who to call. 
who might know something, who understands this foreign leader. And that institutional knowledge takes a long time to be rebuilt, and you may not be able to rebuild it. So uh, from the book, it seems like this, this was the result of both some stunning incompetence and also some design. So the stunning right. incompetence was that they actually had a transition team that produced binders full of information about which, uh, what each department does and what each office within the department mm -hmm. is responsible for and what the key issues are and what the qualities are that you're looking for for people who would fill these roles. And, um, and, and those binders were, were uh, essentially thrown in the trash right after the election day. Uh, no one actually, th the, the, the people who were in charge of the campaign never imagined they were actually going to have to read them, so they didn't pay much attention. And then once they won, they said, well, we don't need that. We'll, we'll do our own mm -hmm. thing. Um, so that's, that's the first part. Right. Um, but then the second part is there's some design to this, which is if you don't appoint people, then there's only mm -hmm. one voice for foreign policy, and it's on a Twitter feed. Yeah, well, the second one is easy to respond to because the president was interviewed and asked this question. Uh, you know, you have so many slots open at the State Department. Isn't this a problem? And his response is, no, I'm the, I'm the one that matters. And uh, regardless of how talented a president is, a president can't run the U.S. government or represent the United States effectively by himself or herself alone. There's just simply too many issues. Expertise does matter. You need to know what is happening, who's doing what, how things might play out. That doesn't mean that presidents have to bow to experts simply because they have a PhD or they've served overseas in a particular capacity. Uh, but American foreign policy, American decision-making is best served when you have people who have actually explored the issues and understand uh, the challenges, and that's been a big problem. And again, the part about the transition, it was one of the most chaotic transitions we have seen, uh, and it was chaotic for the reasons that you pointed out. Originally, uh, and this is one of the great uh, initiatives coming from Bush George W. Bush and Barack Obama. Uh, President Obama was greatly appreciative to President George W. Bush for the efforts that uh, President Bush did to make his transition easy. And that led the United States Congress to pass a law providing resources to staff the transition. I mean, it's remarkable. And the United States is different from most other democracies. Most other democracies are parliamentary systems. You have an election. Uh, a, n a new party wins, the old, you, sort of they just swap out, only at the top level. The United States, we go down several levels in the, uh, in the in administration. They're all political appointees. Ambassadors turn in their uh, resignation. You don't have, you know, secretaries of state or assistant secretaries of state, deputy secretary. So you get to fill all these people. And President Trump, or candidate Trump, did not want to participate in the transition process. It was led by Governor Christie, who understood the importance of the transition process. By all accounts, did a very professional job, uh, compiled, I think, 30 binders worth of material. And uh, the president didn't want to be bothered because he was very superstitious. I don't know to what extent it also was he didn't think he was going to win because that was certainly the conventional wisdom. And then a day or two after... Uh, President Trump was elected, uh, Chris Christie was essentially demoted uh, as head of the transition effort, and uh, a different structure came up, and everything he had done sort of got dumped out, and they started from scratch. And I'll just tell you, it is very hard to staff up an administration, because you're talking more than 4,000 Senate-confirmed positions, and you've got to find people who you have faith in. It was complicated, of course, in this case, that many Republicans, the people you would expect would go into a Republican administration, uh, declared themselves never Trumpers and said they would not uh, take a position. On top of that, the administration also refused to appoint people who would have been eminently qualified, who never said they were never Trumpers, but along the way it said something critical of the president. And so they found themselves trying to f fill positions and not having a really big applicant pool. Yeah. So one of, the, one of the big problems was they weren't looking at anyone who had supported the, um, uh, uh, the uh, Washington consensus. Mm -hmm. And then um, most of the people who uh, had opposed the, the Washington consensus were disqualified in some ways um, 
uh, or in some cases were just cranks. And so trying to find someone who was qualified and agreed with the president uh, became a very, you know, uh, narrow um, uh, eye of a needle to, to thread. Oh, certainly. And then, of course, you had the appointment of the first national security advisor who lasted, I think, 24 days uh, because of uh, his behavior uh, in dealing with the Russians in the lead up to the uh, inauguration, which added another additional uh, level of uh, uh, of upheaval, and he was replaced by uh, General H. R. McMaster, a very talented, very serious gentleman, but also someone who had no prior connection uh, with the president. Uh, and indeed, the sense is the president never really cottoned to General McMaster, and that's problematic because the government is really a team, and to the to the extent that senior officials trust one another. Uh, are seen as being able to speak for the president. That's very important. And I think one of the things that has been very clear in this administration is that nobody speaks for the president but the president. Yeah, well, you describe a, a scene in the book. And again, I recommend The Empty Throne to anyone who's interested in where U.S. foreign policy currently is and where it's going, in which there had been an, an effort by some of his senior leaders mm -hmm. to bring the president to the Pentagon for a half-day briefing in which um, uh, these these expert leaders, people he had selected to be his cabinet uh, officials, were trying to explain the consequences of some of his decisions and the value of alliances mm -hmm. and the importance of our allies. And um, apparently it didn't go well. No, it didn't go well. And we opened the book with the story, and it happens in July of 2017. Uh, Gary Cohn is the head of the National Economic Council. Secretary of Defense Jim Mattis, Secretary of State Rex Tillerson are all concerned about the fact that the president doesn't appreciate why it is that the United States has this outsized role in the world. And so they essentially decide that what they're going to do is hold a sort of American Global Leadership 101 tutorial for the president. So the president comes over to what we call the tank. It's on the outermost ring of the, of the Pentagon. It's where the Joint Chiefs of Staff have their meeting. It's not a very big room. Uh, doesn't have any windows because you don't want anybody to hear what the conversation is. And so this room is packed with sort of a who's who of everybody uh, in the U.S. government on this July day. And they begin doing the briefings. And General, uh, General Mattis, Secretary Mattis, sort of tips his hand right from the beginning. The first thing he says is the greatest gift the greatest generation gave us is a rules-based order. He then turns the conversation or people to do briefings, and there was a lot of strategizing going on in this meeting about how to do it, and they realized the president had spoken a lot on the campaign trail about wanting to bring jobs to America. So a big theme about uh, the briefing was how this actually benefited the United States, how it saved us money, uh, how it created jobs. And by all accounts, the president for the first 50 minutes sort of sat there. And, but at the 50, 55 minute mark, the president started to object to what his tutors were trying to tell him. And he began to disagree with them. And the conversation uh, got fairly, ac uh, not, acrimonious is not the right word, contentious, I guess, mm -hmm. would be the, a better word. And the president sort of when he would say something, was told, well, it's not quite that way. He would simply say flatly, I disagree. And the meeting finally breaks up. The meeting becomes famous later on uh, because Secretary Tillerson is quoted after the meeting saying the president is a, I'll leave the expletive out, moron. And that sort yeah. of dominated uh, the way Washington covered it. The more significant aspect of the meeting was it showed the gulf between where the president was and where his national security team was. They didn't see the world in the same way. Yeah. The president saw a world of competition and domination. It's not the world that his advisors saw. Well, we've been collecting some questions, and obviously there's a lot of interest in, in, in the book in this room. Uh, we talked about the importance of alliances, and let me let me just tee it up a little bit mm -hmm. before asking this question. You know, our that seven of the ten largest defense budgets in the world are our U.S. allies, mm -hmm. um, and if you add the total alliance um, contributions, uh, it effectively means that we double our um, our military budgets and double our our ability to project mm -hmm. security around the around the world by virtue of these alliances. Um, and one of the questions is. Is America abdicating its leadership role in alliances like NATO? 
And will that lead to a collapse of the European alliances that have kept Russia at bay and Europe uh, at peace? That's my great concern. And this is the first American president to question the utility of the NATO alliance. And it's not something that he simply did on the campaign trail. He has come back to this time and time again, most recently doing an interview in which he was at, was the question was raised about you know, defending Montenegro. And he said, I don't know why we're defending Montenegro, a NATO member. I can tell you that while that may not be much noticed in the United States, it was very much noticed in Europe, and I can guarantee you in the Kremlin. Uh, and there's a real concern because, again, NATO wasn't created out of a, a bout of sentimentality or naivete. It was to be created because the greatest generation uh, were hard-headed realists. And they were actually very pessimistic about other countries and other leaders because they had seen that left to themselves, they produced nationalist competition that brought about a catastrophic war the United States couldn't avoid. There was no going into Fortress America. So they built this structure. And you're quite right. Our allies uh, do enhance our security. I will note that uh, the only time Article 5, that's the all for one, one for all provision of NATO, went into effect was after September 11th. I will note that many of our NATO friends uh, have lost troops in Iraq, lost troops in Afghanistan. And I think, you know, again, part of the president's message has been that these alliances have cost us a lot. And I, I don't think any fair accounting of the math allows you to get to that conclusion. Let me make sort of two points. One is that if you look at American defense spending as a share of gross domestic product, today it's about 3.5%. When I was a young man and had a full head of hair, uh, it's been a long time since I've had a full head of hair. Uh, the United States spent something between 7 to 12 percent of its gross domestic product. So we're not talking about uh, this making great claims, at least historically. And I will note the president, for example, often talks about bringing the troops home. Mm-hmm. That would actually raise the cost to the American taxpayer, not save the American taxpayer. Why? Because whether we're talking about troops in Germany, troops in Japan, troops in South Korea, they're actually supported, their costs deferred by the host government. So if you bring the Marines back from Okinawa, you're going to have to put them someplace, and you're going to pay the full freight of wherever they are based. The other thing is I will note that when the president talks about how much this has cost us, it doesn't actually translate into the policy position he's taken. What I've always sort of found very interesting is that when the president was saying, I want to get the allies to pay more, let me be clear, I do think they should devote more uh, to their defenses. He didn't say, I want them to pay more so the United States can pay less. He said, I want them to pay more. And by the way, we're going to spend more than anybody because that's how you prepare for peace. And so there's a disconnect in the president's logic there. So there's no there's no peace dividend or, no, or is, ally dividend that comes from... Right. Even though it's embedded in an argument that this is somehow produces, he called it in the his inaugural address, an American carnage. Because mm-hmm. he literally, in that speech, ties America's overseas commitments to uh, the, the sad and failing state of American inner cities, of infrastructure and the like. And I find it very hard to draw that line, even though I agree that we have abandoned our inner cities, that we do have infrastructure problems and the like. But I don't think it's because we have troops in South Korea. So the, the, the president has famously gone after some of our allies um, uh, not just NATO, but also, um, you know, the Prime Minister of Canada, the Prime Minister of Australia had, had the phone hung up on him. There, are, I mean, there are there are these fairly famous stories. Uh, the the there are some world leaders who he seems to be um, much kinder to, mm-hmm. and we have a few questions about those. Okay. Uh, there's a, there's a you know there, there's been a clear pattern whether it's North Korea or Russia. The countries who we've traditionally been hostile to, the president has. Uh, has expressed a desire to, to build good relationships. Um, so uh, how, how, how do you see our foreign policy working in North Korea um, and, and the, 
the questioner here says, particularly in light of the fact that um, his objectives and um, intentions seem to keep shifting in order to assure that he can say he's in a, in a good place with the North Korean leader. Okay, uh, there's a lot in that question, and I probably won't give you an adequate answer, so I apologize. So let me begin first by saying uh, President Trump is not the first president to uh, have spats or disagreements with American friends and allies. So I don't want to suggest that somehow every president from Truman up to uh, Barack Obama got along swimmingly uh, with their counterparts overseas. Among others, I will note that there's a story told that Lyndon Johnson took great exception when a Canadian prime minister criticized the Vietnam War, supposedly picked the Canadian prime minister up by his lapels as he shouted at him. Uh, LBJ was a very big and intimidating man. Yeah. So I want to be very clear there. Second one I would just make, uh, Sometimes uh, banging the table with your friends is the right thing to do uh, That because you, you want to get their attention and show that you're serious. So that in and of itself is not bad. Uh, though, you know, this is in some sense, uh, I equate to like cayenne pepper. Uh, it has its uses, but not everywhere and at all times. Uh, going beyond that, I do think there's a significant problem that the president... Uh, has been overly solicitous, if I can put it that way, of authoritarian leaders. Now, this flows directly from the president's worldview. He was very clear. He doesn't think America is exceptional. He doesn't think that the United States has any business worrying about democracy or human rights in other countries. Again, this was not a secret. The president, then uh, candidate Trump, said it over and over again uh, on the campaign trail that he didn't see that as our job, and he has been consistent. Indeed, if you rank presidents in terms of how faithful they are to what they said in the campaign trail, uh, I think you would have to give Donald Trump an A. Uh, he said what he was going to do. He's doing what he said. I just think the consequences of that are destructive because what we're seeing is that it is feeding, not creating, but it's feeding and reinforcing a shift toward authoritarianism uh, that we're seeing around the world. Again, this predated Donald Trump. I'm not arguing that we call the democratic recession or regression uh, somehow began on January 20th, 2017. But I wouldn't forget that sort of the, the willingness of the United States to stand up to human rights tragedies around the world are significant. And we're quiet. People feel emboldened. And when it is you gloss over what Rodrigo Duterte, the president of the Philippines, is doing with extrajudicial uh, violence, quote, against drug traffickers, some of whom seem to have almost no connection to drug trafficking, that is a problem. When you overlook the suppression of Uyghurs in Western China, that's a problem. When you overlook the oppression of uh, the Rohingya in Burma, that's a problem. Things get worse rather than better. I'm always struck uh, when I sort of read, and I've read a lot of the writings of Soviet dissidents and how much praise they had for Ronald Reagan and that they recognized that many of his criticisms of the Soviet Union were not going to make their lives better and might in some ways actually make their lives worse. But the fact that you had an American president standing up for values, calling the Soviet Union for what it was, empowered them. And I think when you stop doing that, you stop empowering people who are fighting for values that Americans hold dear. And that, I think, is a foreign policy mistake. Yeah. Well, the, the conventional wisdom on Russia at the end of the Obama administration was that Russia was playing a losing hand fairly well, but it was still a losing hand. Yep. Uh, they had very little that people wanted to buy. Um, um, basically fossil fuels, arms, and vodka. And yep. well, the vodka was popular, yep. but that was, that was pretty much it. And that um, with fuel prices where they were, it wasn't enough for them to support mm -hmm. uh, their economy, and the economy was in a, a perpetual downward, downward trend. Mm -hmm. um, and um, in now giving Russia sort of greater credibility um, and allowing Russia to get away with some of the uh, tricks and um, and and um, misconduct that it's been engaged in in order to stay relevant as its economy has declined. Uh, the question is: Is this president actually, in, instead of using our massive leverage mm -hmm. on a weakened adversary, actually propping up the adversary and making them stronger? 
I mean, the, the Russia policy of this administration is interesting because there is a division between what the president says and does and what the rest of his administration says and does. You have in December of 2017, the rollout of the national security strategy. It's one of these documents that Congress mandates uh, be done, uh, produced every couple of years. They're never as good as advertised. It's actually really hard to devise a strategy for the United States because doing so requires you not only to say what the problems are, but also how you would prioritize them. And that's, of course, where people disagree because everybody yeah. wants to do everything and assume it can be done simultaneously and nothing is going to actually cost you too much. Uh, so the the U.S. government, and I think basically uh, reinforced by Congress, which is polarized on many issues, but on Russia, uh, outside of the question of interference in the election, has been unified. It was uh, Congress had pushed for additional sanctions uh, on the Russians. Uh, has one view, but the president, uh, again, uh, has seemed very reluctant to say anything negative about or to Mr. Putin. Of course, you have the Helsinki summit, which was remarkable in that you have a American president meeting with a Russian counterpart, and there are no note takers present. You know what yep. the drill is. And there are reasons why you want other people in the room with the president, so nobody can misrepresent what the president has said. And I think the president's uh, performance in the uh, press conference after it uh, did himself in the country a great disservice. And to judge by public opinion polls, most Americans felt the same way. Yeah, a quick story. When I was getting briefed to go out to post, I met with um, uh, Henry Kissinger. And I asked mm -hmm. him at the end of our meeting, you know, he'd sent lots of uh, diplomats abroad. I asked him if there was anything I should be aware of that we had discussed and he pointed to the note taker and he said beware of them <laughs> they write everything down <laughs> yeah. so um they do write everything down and that's that's useful um the other the other um issue that you're raising to talk about our our activities in russia is who's advising the president um on russia besides himself and as far as we can tell from the media um it's really um jared kushner who is kind of the Swiss army knife mm -hmm. of foreign policy because he's also the lead person um, for Israel, mm -hmm. Palestine, Palestinian relations. Mm -hmm. He's also responsible for Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. um, and so pretty much any, any hotspot, I think he's got a role in North Korea as well, doesn't he? So I, I, I think this is, um, first, um, what are your thoughts about the implications of those multiple roles mm -hmm. for him? And then secondly, do you think his profile and position has changed since John Bolton came into the administration? Uh, it's hard to discern what role Mr. Kushner plays in this administration. And I think perhaps on a number of issues, he perhaps gets too much media coverage uh, in terms of uh, what he does. I think, at least as I look at, at candidate Trump and President Trump, what sort of comes across to me is the president does what he wishes and doesn't rely on anyone in particular to give him advice. He's been asked numerous times by reporters as who do you get advice from? And his answer generally has been myself. Uh, this is a gentleman who uh, ran for the presidency and didn't do all the normal things. What do you normally do? Think of the Clinton right. campaign. You form advisory teams. You reach out to people who might staff your administrations. This is back to the transition question. They form study group and advisory group. They write white papers. Candidate Trump went around and was taking positions on a variety of issues, and he had no advisory team. And he was frequently asking to say, well, I will get that to you, I'm going to form mine. They're going to be the best, and they're going to be the brightest. But essentially, he never did it, and that's because this is a president who operates from the gut. He believes that he sees further than anyone else, and on any issue, he would say that he knows more than anyone else. Most notably, I think if you look at the 60 Minutes interview recently with Leslie Stahl, and the question of NATO came up. And uh, he said he knows more about NATO than General Mattis, even though General Mattis has spent his life in the military. And I think the president is being quite honest about how he sees the world and who he listens to. Uh, he clearly talks to a lot of people, uh, but the people he's soliciting opinions from may not have any particular expertise. But I think at the end of the day, the president believes, well, as he said to Leslie Stahl, I'm president. 
Yeah. And I need something everyone said he couldn't do. And I think that's what guides him. So if there's not room for, for two stable geniuses in the, mm-hmm. uh, in the Oval Office, then what, where does, uh, I'm going to combine a couple of questions here, uh, where does that leave Secretary Pompeo and, um, uh, and National Security Advisor John Bolton? I think anyone in this administration is always playing catch up because the president is to borrow one of his favorite treat, uh, favorite uh, traits is he's unpredictable. I note that uh, he does a lot of diplomacy by Twitter. Uh, that in and of itself is not necessarily bad. I think we have to sort of avoid sort of confusing uh, some of the unusual thing Trump does and then some, because it's not done the traditional way that it must be bad. I think it's a mistake to go down that road. But what's remarkable about the way the president tweets is that it doesn't flow from any considered discussion of an issue. It's not as if he sat and talked to his, convened his national security team, they've weighed the options, made a decision, and now he's going to sort of use Twitter as a means to communicate that decision or to frame that decision. Uh, Rather, quite often, these announcements are coming as a total surprise uh, to members of his administration. Uh, Secretary Tillerson, when he was secretary, acknowledged this, that in essence, they would sort of get a tweet and then they would figure out how to respond to it and how could they use that and what they're doing. And the problem, of course, is that you're empowered as a senior official in an administration if you were seen as speaking for the president. The moment it becomes clear that you don't know what the president's thinking or you cannot Uh, say what the president's going to do, you're diminished. Let me give you one crisp example that's playing out right now, and it's in the trade war with China. The president uh, has recently announced or communicated to the Chinese that uh, the Chinese are going to have to propose a deal. He's not going to propose one. They have to come up with a deal that satisfies him. And the response from Beijing uh, goes along the following lines. Well, we proposed a deal to Secretary of Commerce Wilbur Ross. He accepted it. You overturned it. We propose another deal this May uh, with Secretary of Treasury, Mr. Mnuchin. You overturned it. We can't produce deals if we don't have an idea as to what it is you want. So now you're at a loggerheads. And I think, you know, this is a real problem when you don't have an administration that on many of these issues doesn't have a clear strategy. That doesn't mean that individual cabinet members or national security advisor doesn't have his or her idea of how this is going to play out or how they want it to play out, but they're not speaking for the president of the United States. One of the questions I received um, says, well, well, look, the, the U.S. has lost um, thousands of lives over the past few decades, being the world's police. Right. Um, and all the president's doing is saying, you know, let someone else do it for a while. We're, we're going to stop being the world's police. Now, okay. um, I guess the first question is, is that really true? I mean, you, you said he's going to increase the, the defense budget. Mm-hmm. Does that mean we're, we're retreating on being the world's police or we're just going to continue to be the world's police, mm-hmm. but other people have to police their own spheres of influence more? Okay. Well, the, the, the operative word there is, policemen, Mm -hmm. okay, and I'm talking about leadership. They're not the same thing. And let's note that, yes, Americans have died uh, overseas, most notably in Iraq. The invasion of Iraq was not something mandated by American leadership of the world. Indeed, in Iraq, as previously in Vietnam, America's closest friends and allies urged the United States not to go in. You may remember, for those of you old enough, there's some people in the back room who look young, maybe they aren't old enough uh, for this, but in 2003, Americans were rechristening French fries, freedom fries. Mm -hmm. And we were taking perfectly good red wine and pouring it down the drain because we were outraged that we had friends and allies who said invading Iraq is a bad idea. It will not produce a good outcome. Same thing going to have been true in Vietnam. So it wasn't the case that we were doing this because we had to do it for our friends and allies. We had done it uh, for our own. And I would say, secondly, when you look at this, this issue, America, when it has become engaged overseas, and the reason for trying to lead others to solve problems is because we live in a world in which problems don't stay at home. 
problems cross borders. Okay, again, we had a, a tale told to us in the late 1930s that America could avoid what was happening in Europe and in Asia if it stayed within Fortress America. That was the promise of the American First Committee. It was a promise uh, pushed and held by some pretty prominent people. I will note that when the America First Committee was formed on September 4th, 1939, by students at Yale Law School, New Haven, Connecticut, two of the initiators, uh, one turned out to be a future American president, Gerald R. Ford, another became a Supreme Court Justice, Potter Stewart. The American First Committee was supported by a future president, a gentleman named John F. Kennedy, who had a check, I think, for $100 to support its activities. So it was a way of looking at the world, and it made a promise. If we stay apart, we'll be safe. That, again, ended on December 7th, 1941. And we look around problems today, and the, and the problem of sort of letting the world do as it wishes, or to borrow the phrase of Bob Cake, and again, I'll plug his... Uh, equally excellent book, The Jungle Grows Back. Letting the jungle grow back is that it will harm our interests and our values. Uh, these problems don't stay at home, they travel. Well, you are, the, 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 the world you describe, I have to say, uh, Fortress America seems like a bleaker place than the shining city on the hill. Um, mm -hmm. And so we have a couple questions that are looking for some optimism. Okay. One is, what are the best ways that American, America can recover post-Trump? will be able to recover in any way. Okay. Uh, I would say that whoever is the president to succeed Donald Trump may be, and let me emphasize, may be the luckiest person. If he or she is interested in resuming American global leadership, uh, again, what I'm struck by is I go from country to country, even countries that may sort of have reputations for being critical of American leadership, is that they really want that leadership. They want America to come back. And it's a really interesting thing. Let me just do some a quick poll that's been done. As you all probably know, Pew does a lot of polling work. And uh, they've asked people, what do you think of Donald Trump around the world? And he gets very low marks. In, in some of our countries like... Uh, uh, in Europe, sort of the difference in the favorability rating for Barack Obama to Donald Trump is 50 points. But if you ask people a different question around the world, and you say, who would you prefer to be the world leader? China, Russia, the United States? The United States wins hands down because the traditional American message of openness, of freedom, of individual liberty is remarkably powerful across countries, across continents, across religions. Well, we uh, we have one minute left for uh, a final question. And Speed round. We have some foreign um, uh, foreign policy officers uh, in the uh, or career foreign service officers in the audience. So, what advice do you have for them about remaining in the foreign service, going into the foreign service? Uh, during this time? I think the Foreign Service is a remarkably important profession. I have great admiration for people who work uh, in the Foreign Service, uh, and I understand when they start off, maybe some of their initial jobs aren't most exciting. Stamping visas probably isn't the uh, <laughs> most fun thing, but they represent America abroad. They carry the American message abroad. They're good for American businesses. If you want to sell into places, it is good to have somebody there talking up what you do. And I'll put it to you this way. If you look at China right now, okay, China is investing heavily in its uh, foreign service because the rule is if you don't show up, no one's going to listen to you. Show up. Well, and thank you, everyone in the room, for showing up. Uh, and before we open it up for questions, let's thank Dr. Jim Lindsay. Thank you.